entire course circa 1200 to the present. This video is designed to be watched when you're finished learning the material and ready to study for the AP exam. So we'll look at the way the course is organized. We have four time periods and nine units shown here. So we're going to look at each of these time periods in turn and ways that you can use those organizations to help you study. Starting with time period one, our first unit really reviewed key states in various parts of the world. So we went in turn around these regions of the world and looked at some of the political systems that developed, cultural traditions, social structures, things like that. And then in unit two, we looked at our three key trade networks from this time period. We looked at the Mongols who had a huge impact on trade and politics during that time period. And then we looked at the cultural and environmental effects of trade. So let's look at some of those ideas in more detail. The big idea for unit one is how did these states form and how did they maintain order? What techniques did they use to control their citizens? And for unit two, it was how these trade networks developed and what their impact was on societies. And what we'll see here is that we can look at an interconnection between these two units, that they're not completely separate ideas. There's a lot of overlap and interplay between them. And of course, they're happening and developing at the same time. So the way we can do that is to look at how states affected the development of trade networks. That would be sort of the arrow going this way. And then how trade networks affected the development of states going back that way. We can use these themes of our course to help us break down those ideas into some parts that we can manage. So we might look at the way that the wealth or status of merchants affected class structures. We might look at the way that states relied on trade revenue to function. We might look at how geography has an impact on trade and how states can manage that. We might look at the way that trade caused cultural diffusion, such as the spread of religion. We might look at the way that trade networks expanded because there were new markets needed for economic growth and the importance of technology for trade. So we can, just to take one example, we can look at China and the Silk Roads and kind of see a lot of these ideas in the experience of China. So the Song Dynasty in this region here flourished during this time period, partly because of economic growth. So China built things like the Grand Canal. There are a lot of caravans Sarai along the Silk Road trade network to facilitate the exchange of goods. One of the main reasons the Silk Roads existed was because Chinese goods were in such high demand. And one of the reasons the Song Dynasty flourished is because China was able to use the revenue for two main purposes, to organize the state and pay for those bureaucratic officials that were such an important part of their Confucian-inspired political system, and also to develop trade infrastructure such as the Grand Canal, also roads that helped to facilitate the movement of goods, markets for the sale of goods. We can also look at the fact that the Silk Roads is what brought Buddhism to China from India, where it originated down here, and that from China it spread throughout East Asia. And we can also look at the fact that the demand for those goods was the motivation for some inventions such as the compass, which was used both along the Silk Roads and, of course, in Indian Ocean trade as well. Now, it's important to note that this pattern is true for lots of other states. We could look at Mali and the Trans-Saharan Trade Network. We could look at Mansa Musa, for instance, and see a lot of these same kinds of patterns about states relying on trade to function, about being able to manage the environment, in this case, to cross the Sahara Desert, about the spread of Islam to North Africa. We can look at that same pattern in Indian Ocean. We could look at a kingdom like Malacca down here and its location along an important trade route on Indian Ocean trade. China is just meant to be one example of the way that these two units interact with each other. What we can look at now is a way that you can do some analysis or some essay type thinking to review this information. And in world history, we like to use some constructs to help us make sense of all this stuff. So we've talked about the historical themes before. And the other thing we can talk about is our thinking or analysis skills. So throughout the course, we've looked at causation, which consists of cause and effect, comparison, whether things are similar or different, and continuity and change over a time period. And so what we can do is these are just some examples of ways that you could take the skill and apply it to a theme. So I could look at the effects of political structures on class. I could compare social hierarchies in two states. I could look at continuities and changes of social structures in a particular state. I could pick China or I could pick the Abbasid Caliphate or something like that. I could compare how states administered power. I could look at the causes and effects of the growth of trade networks. I could look at continuities and changes of technology used in trade networks over time. I could pick a particular region and look at the continuities and changes of the states or the political systems in that region. 
the best way for you to study is to do something. For causation, I like to make a T chart. Maybe I might have cause and effect here. So for this one about trade networks, I might look at causes and effects and list them here. I also like to make a T chart for comparison. In this case, if I was comparing the diffusion of culture in two networks, I would write the two networks. Maybe I put Indian Ocean and Trans-Saharan, for instance, and I'd write that down. For continuity and change over time, I like to take a timeline. I might use my dates from my unit here. And then I would look at states in a region, for instance, and I would pick East Asia, perhaps, and I'd say, okay, here's the states around 1200, here's this, here's this, here's this. I might notice for China, for instance, that there's a rise and fall of the Mongol Empire during this time period. Specific information to help you do this kind of review is contained in the other videos. So there's unit videos and there's chapter videos. So you can drill down into these specific chapters and, of course, use the work you've done all year to help you with some of this information. But that would really be a great way to study. Moving on to time period two, we have a very similar organization as we did in time period one. We're up to 1450 to 1750, but we still have this interconnection between states and between economic connections. And we'll see a little bit of a difference in the way it's organized here because this is land-based and this is maritime or transoceanic. So we looked at how land-based empires expanded and were administered. Then there was some stuff about religion and culture in those empires. The big idea for Unit 4 is the Columbian Exchange, so it's the beginning of European maritime empires, both across the Atlantic in the Americas and also increasing European presence in Asia. So we looked at the development of those empires and the way that they were challenged and some of the social hierarchies that were developed in those empires. So our same structure here, we're looking in Unit 3 at how land-based empires were formed and maintained order. And in Unit 4, we looked at how the transoceanic empires were developed and their impact on societies. And again, the big idea there is the rise of Europe. So we can compare or look at both of those empires and how they're similar or different. And we can also look at an overlap in the patterns of how they maintain control. Some of these theme-based ideas are the same, this idea of the role of merchants in the class structure. The fact that states relied on military power to function. You might remember we call these gunpowder empires. So there's a new importance of military technology. The same idea of trade and geography. The same idea of trade causing cultural diffusion. Of course, it might be new ones like the spread of Christianity from Europe to the Americas. This idea of new markets need, needed for economic growth and relying on technology. So you can see we start to see some patterns in world history that help us make sense of all this information. We talked about Europe's power growing, so we can use Spain as an example here. So you might remember that the gunpowder empires from Unit 3, that would be places like the Safavid, Mughal, and Ottoman Empire, had kind of blocked that land-based access to Asia. So a big connection from China to Europe was the Silk Roads. That's now essentially blocked by this Ottoman presence, and so that motivates Europe to develop navigation technology to make expansion possible. So you might remember Portugal is going to make their way down around Africa, and have direct access to Asia, and that's going to motivate the Spanish to send Columbus this way. He runs into the Americas and changes the fate of world history. The Spanish and other European nations will then use military power to conquer lands in the Americas. Here's initially some of the Spanish territory in the Americas. They're motivated by that competition we talked about, such as with, with Portugal, and you might remember they created race-based hierarchies in the American colonies. So this is a map showing in 1714 some of those colonies, and we get the beginning, and remember that's going to expand, of European colonization of the Americas. And those gunpowder empires, again, Mughal, Safavid, Ottoman. We also talked a bit about the Russian Empire. The Ming Dynasty and China is still a factor. And so again, we have the same idea of looking at a pattern and remembering that while we just kind of talked about Spain here as an example, we could do the same kind of analysis for a different country. We could look at the British and what they're doing with their colonies in North America. We could look at the Portuguese presence in trade in Asia. We could look at the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch colonizing what is now Indonesia. So remember, Spain is just one example of this pattern. So here's that same idea of using skills and themes to create some opportunities for you to do some analysis. So again, a lot of these answers would be contained in the unit and chapter videos. You could compare the impact of the environment in the Colombian Exchange, perhaps on two regions. You could compare technology and two trade networks. You could look at continuities and changes of states in a particular region again. You could look at the causes and effects of the way that states have political control over people. So again, that idea of maybe making T-charts for these, 
creating a timeline and filling in some of those things like what states were where or what was going on with trade in the Americas both before and after 1450. Remember, we have that roughly 1500 tipping point about the before and after the hemispheres were connected by trade. So this is a good tool to use to help you study time period two. In time period three, we're looking at 1750 to 1900. Our two units were revolutions and the consequences of industrialization. And you might remember in unit five, we really had two kinds of revolutions. We had those political revolutions in the, primarily the Americas, like Haitian and American revolution that overturned European control of the Americas. And then of course we have the industrial revolution. So the rest of unit five looks at a lot of factors of industrialization. In unit six, we looked at the consequences of industrialization, starting with imperialism, and that's really the big story, the increasing economic globalization, and then we looked at some of the causes and effects of migration, which is connected to this idea of regions becoming even more connected by trade. The big idea for unit five then, there's kind of two, there's a political idea with enlightenment inspired revolutions and then industrialization. And the big idea for unit six is European imperialism and the beginnings of globalization. Here's the way we can think about those two units being connected to each other, that kind of same idea, which would really be unit five directly leading to unit six. These revolutions cause Europe to lose control over their colonies in the Americas. So all this stuff is gonna go away. At roughly the same time, industrialization is creating an even greater need for resources, which is the motivation for imperialism. And that's kind of how we get from this map to this map. So in this map, which is roughly 1900 at the end of our time period, we have the Americas being independent states, and now we have these European colonies in Africa and Asia. And that's largely because of these Enlightenment-inspired revolutions in the Americas. So some of those common patterns, what were the effects of the revolutions on social structures? Did they change those class structures? These new ideas inspired by the Enlightenment about political freedom, the importance of natural resources in business, particularly in an industrialized economy, the cultural role of nationalism inspiring in some cases, for instance, in the United States, the creation of new nations, a completely new economic system that is industrial and capitalist, and all this new technology that made that possible. So we can look at the, how that works with just one country here, which will be Great Britain for us. So Great Britain has these valuable colonies in the Americas that they lose to a new American nationalism. And that, of course, is the American Revolution, which means Britain loses access to all of the economic benefits of their former colonies in this part of the Americas. At about the same time, there are British inventions in the textile industry, like the spinning jenny, that create an even greater need for resources to fuel those textile factories, such as cotton. One of the motivations for British imperialism, such as the activities of the East India Company, is to gain more access to those resources. And India, in our example as it happens, was a major source of cotton. So the British colonize India, and by the end of the 19th century, they continue that process and have a global British empire. So you can see this kind of color right here. Here's Australia, India, parts of Northeast Africa, parts of Southern Africa. And this pattern, of course, is repeated by other nations. So the French, for instance, that would be the green color on this map, have their own colonies in Northwest Africa in modern day Southeast Asia. And so this pattern of searching for economic benefit is really the driving force of imperialism. And one thing to keep in mind with these countries in Europe is their competition with each other is a big driving force for that. So in that first wave from time period two, we had primarily the Portuguese and the Spanish competing with each other. Now we have primarily the British and the French. And of course there's other nations involved. You can see on this map, there are still some Portuguese colonies. The Germans are a little bit late to the game, but they get involved. There's the Belgian Congo. But what we have here is a good piece of analysis to just kind of keep in the back of your mind is that a lot of the motivation for, for European behavior during this time of expansion is competition between European nations. So once again, here are some ideas about how we can do some analysis with skills and themes. So we won't go over every one, but you could compare the effects of revolutions on social hierarchies in two different states. You could look at continuities and changes of political structures in the Americas over this time period. That would be before and after the revolutions, probably. 
you could look at the causes and effects of European imperialism. You could look at the causes and effects of one or more revolutions in the Americas. You could look at how cultural traditions in two European colonies changed or stayed the same over time. And remember, you can use unit and chapter videos and, of course, the work you've done this year in your course to help you navigate this information. In our last time period, it had three units. It went from 1900 to the present. In Unit 7, we had global conflict. That's essentially the two world wars and the depression. In Unit 8, we looked at the Cold War and the process of states becoming independent from imperialism, which we call decolonization. And then in Unit 9, we looked at increasing economic globalization. We looked at the technology related to that, what's going on with the economics, and then some information about globalized culture. So to think about the three units together, we can remind ourselves that the end of World War II marked the end of a global power structure. That was that European imperialism-based power structure. Those nations we mentioned in the last time period, whether it's Spain and Portugal or Britain and France, are essentially losing their global power by the end of World War II, and they are replaced with two new superpowers. That would, of course, be the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And so the Cold War is about their struggle for influence as countries get their independence on the countries that are that are um, choosing their political and economic futures. And then after the fall of communism at the end of the Cold War, we have the global dominance of capitalism, which is one of the things that really fuels this economic globalization. And we look in Unit 9 at free trade and economic liberalism as a, a motivator for that. Some of our theme-based patterns we can look for. One of the social features of globalization is a desire to have social equality. So we can look at whether that's been possible. The role of human rights and the government. The role of the government in ensuring human rights for people. The causes and effects of globalization on the natural world. The interplay of nationalism and culture. Nationalism as countries have independence, for instance. The economic forces that drove globalization, like capitalism and then more specifically liberalism and the pros and cons of the technology that we have done. It's made globalization possible, but of course there's been environmental damage. Just to pick one country to look at what this has looked like, we can look at the United States, which before these two world wars had been isolationist and was kind of dragged into both of them, that opposed the expansion of communism during the Cold War, that encouraged democratic governments in former colonies, such as supporting South Vietnam during the Vietnam War, that the United States supported free trade policies and became the wealthiest country in the world and the driving force of economic globalization, and by the early 21st century has become the world's dominant economy. So the big story with these three units, and really the whole course from an economic standpoint, and maybe some others too, is the way that the world has become even more interconnected and the fact that economics has really been the driving force of that. So we started with this map of our Silk Roads, Indian Ocean, Trans-Saharan trade networks. Remember, there was no contact with the Americas back in 1200 or so. And now here's a map showing shipping lanes in the 21st century, and you can see how incredibly interconnected the whole world is. So that's, on one level, you could think of that as being the story of our entire course. Once again, here's some ways you can use themes and skills to review this information. So you could look, for instance, at the continuity and changes of gender and race relations before and after 1950. You could compare political systems during the Cold War. You can look at the causes and effects of economic globalization or the causes and effects of the two world wars. You could compare cultural resistance to imperialism in two colonies, maybe in Africa or in Asia. You could look at continuities and changes in global economic systems before and after the end of the Cold War. And remember, I'd use a timeline for these and probably T-charts for these. So you can use these as constructs to help you review and make sense of these. So it would be great studying if you were to make charts, write up body paragraphs, even write whole essays, write specific information, go back in your notes, look at the videos, and do all that kind of work so that you are practicing your skills at the same time that reviewing the information. So that is your whole course overview, and I hope it helps you study and you have a great AP test. Happy studying!